Um, today we're going to get going. Our guest uh, musician today is Pete Simple. And so let's welcome Pete, and he's going to kick us off. So, hi. Uh, he was, Mike asked me to introduce myself. I'm Pete uh, Lippincott. My band's called Pete Simple. I'm from Houston, Texas. And uh, I was going to play some music for you. So, yeah, simple enough. This song it, uh, is called uh, uh, Come Home Soon, I guess. <laughs> heart is on my sleeve. I wish your hand were there on my shoulder. I have learned emptiness. Come back home soon. Someone told me to listen to my heart. Someone asked you to dance and not away. Find it harder to live in this time apart. Just hope this song speaks to you. So I drink to your love not to forget, but to remember the love lost poured from my heart. My hands are working hard to have you in my life again. My mind is racing full of consequence. Someone told me to listen to my heart. Someone asked you to dance and not away. Find it harder to live in this time apart Just hope this song speaks to you My love is anticipated in the shadows I hope and pray for your happiness to return Oh, oh, oh Someone told me to listen to my heart Someone asked you to dance and not awake Find it harder to live in this time apart Just hope this song speaks to you So I will not go quietly when it comes to love I would run to you given the chance The dreams in between us were ours alone Come home, baby please come home Someone told me to listen to my heart Someone asked you to dance and not away I find it harder to live in this time apart I just hope this song speaks to you You know this song, it's for you Cause you know this song, well it's for you background story about that. I'm going through a very large change in my life right now. And um, I guess that's the best way to say it without being specific. Uh, this other song is about uh, moving. Um, it's called uh, Wouldn't It Be Nice, but not by the Beach Boys. <laughs> so it uh, starts like this. Wouldn't it be nice to leave Los Angeles? She said, let's just see comes of it, finding those hipsters that hang around. Wouldn't it be nice to leave tonight? Let the rain come down on you. When the whisper moonlit night sings so softly across your tongue. Let the rain come down on me. Cause you will always write my wrong. Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice to leave Houston, Texas? She said, let's just see what comes of it. Riding a rail, silently downtown to not hide. It's a one-way ticket to nowhere out of sight. Let the rain down on you. Whisper moonlit night sing so softly across your tongue. Let the rain down on me. Cause you will always right my wrongs. Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be 
esquinas something we're calling a community moment where people from our community just share a little bit about their story kind of uh, why, why they're here what they're passionate about and you know kind of their journey and uh, this week Jared Smith is gonna do that for us so welcome Jared. Hi. Good morning I'm Jared Smith um, glad to be here just excited um, I grew up in Alaska uh, spent 18 years there Actually, I spent, uh, if you're familiar with that, Alaska, Anchorage is here, Juneau's down in here, Fairbanks in the center. I actually spent a lot of my time in the middle of nowhere, uh, way out uh, there, 300 miles west of Anchorage. Uh, it's in a little village. Can you see Russia from there? <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you notice here, the, the Yukon River comes along and makes a little bend here and it goes into the Bering Strait, so we were kind of on the back side of that bend. Uh, it's called the Bush. Uh, it's in a region of Alaska where they speak the language uh, Yupik. Um, there's my village. So a uh, little tiny thing. It says Russian Mission Airport. Don't be confused. That's a dirt strip. <laughs> <laughs> that when the Yukon River floods, it floods. Um, but that was where I was at. There's an aerial shot of it. Uh, you know, Google's a wonderful thing. It's like, wow, I can find all these pictures of my village. Uh, when I lived there, all this stuff that was up here wasn't there. Uh, your tax dollars built all that. Um, part of our outreach to the Yupik people, uh, studying you know what we how we treated the Eskimos versus the American Indians. Interesting study. Uh, did a much better job with the Alaskan natives. Um, so my parents lived there as the school teachers. They were the two school teachers. We were the four uh, white people in a village of about 160 natives. Uh, I did all kinds of fun things when I was out there that uh, make it rather surprising that I'm actually alive today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so and I, I tell stories uh, from this experience that I had there, uh, and I've often told these stories in church. This particular story I'm going to tell you right now, I didn't realize a very key thing about it until I was preparing it for this audience. So the story I'm going to talk about is uh, when I was a child, my dad owned a uh, ski or snow machine. So if you all watch uh, X Games, you see there are high-powered snowmobiles out there. Uh, this was not it. <laughs> this is a 1970s uh, ski snowmobile that uh, ran about half the time. And so my dad would hook that up to a, a dog sled, load the kids in it, and we would often go out and do things. And so on a particular day, we had hitched this thing up and we had gone up the Yukon River to the next village up. Uh, we had some friends that had a mining camp that we would sometimes check in on. So middle of winter, riding up the Yukon River in the middle of Nowheresville uh, with your family. Uh, my parents were a little crazy. Um, and we were on our way back. 
when uh, the skew broke down and I looked up and saw this coming toward us. So e even as a child of six or seven, you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that if you're stuck on the Yukon River in an Alaskan blizzard, you're probably going to die. Um, so I was a little worried. <laughs> uh, so I still remember today being worried about that experience and seeing this and saying, okay, Dad, what exactly are we going to do here? Um, and my dad looked at me and he said, don't worry about it. I'm going to get this thing running, and we're going to get back to, our, back to our village. If we don't, there's a cabin uh, right up here on this uh, river that I know about. So my dad was very familiar with the river. The natives fish during the summer. It's one of their main food sources. And they have fishing lodges all down the river. So he knew there were cabins there that we could go to. What uh, struck me about that is there were two things that he was going to count on to get us out of there. One, the fact that that's not my dad. Uh, by the way, I'm not a preacher, right? So I can't tell preacher stories. My stories have to be rather truthful. Uh, <laughs> but I may dramatize a little bit. So I didn't have a picture of my dad working on a skew. I picked, found an internet picture. So there's a little dramatization here. My dad knew how to work on small engines. He knew how to keep the snowmobile running. And he was going to count on his skill to do that. Uh, I inherited a lot of that skill. Uh, that's why I'm an engineer. Whenever I came across a small engine, my first impulse is to take it apart and see if I can put it back together and if it still runs. Uh, but my dad knew how to fix it, so he was going to count on that skill. Uh, we were also going to count on the cabin that he knew about. Uh, what's interesting about it is he didn't tell us to stop and pray. Um, and the lesson that I now take about that is that in a situation where we needed help, what we were going to count on was knowing somebody that knew what to do. So in that case, that was my dad. Um, what I'm excited about about this community is it gives us an opportunity to know people that know how to do things, right? I don't, have to, I don't have to know how to do everything. I don't have to have everything. I can know people that can make my life better and I can make your life better. And we can help each other. And that's part of us being a tribe, being us a community, and all our hands together making the world a better place. So I'm looking forward to today and our future. I've led a boring life. <laughs> that was, wow, that's like something out of the National Geographic. That was good. Thank you so much, Jared. Um, um, and I'm going to invite John to do a give us a brief reading from E.O. Wilson to get us going. Good morning, everybody. So. This is from The Social Conquest of the Earth, and if I sound odd, it's because I'm recouping from a sinus infection, <laughs> so just bear with me. Scientific knowledge and technology double every one to two decades, depending on the discipline in which information is measured. This exponential growth makes the future impossible to predict beyond a decade, let alone centuries or millennia. Futurists are therefore prone to dwell upon those directions which, in their opinion, humanity should go. But given our miserable lack of self-understanding as a species, the better goal of this time may be to choose where not to go. What then should we be careful to avoid? In thinking about the subject, we are destined always to come back full circle to the existential questions. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Human beings are actors in a story. We are the growing point of an unfinished epic. The answer to the existential questions must lie in history. And that, of course, is the approach taken by the humanities. But conventional history by itself is truncated in both its timeline and its perception of the human organism. History makes no sense without prehistory. And prehistory makes no sense without biology. Humanity is a biological species in a biological world. In every function of our bodies and mind, and at every level, we are exquisitely well adapted to live on this particular planet. We belong in the biosphere of our birth. Although exalted in many ways, we remain an animal species of the global fauna. Our lives are restrained by the two laws of biology. 
all of life's entities and processes are obedient to the laws of physics and chemistry, and all of life's entities and processes have arisen through evolution by natural selection. Thank you, John. <laughs> Can you hear me okay in the back row? Um, and as we talk today, I would like to evolve. Bear with us as a community, especially if this is your first time. We don't know what we're doing. Um, we, I believe on evolution at all levels, and this is going to evolve. And we're going to experiment with things week by week. And, uh, but if you do have questions or comments, even in the middle of the talk or message, not the sermon, um, uh, please feel free to um, uh, share them and you know uh, pitch in. Um, I want you. I want to start by asking you to imagine a particularly vivid memory from childhood. You know, so if right now I'm thinking about reading the encyclopedias on the floor of the living room at my grandmother's house on Greenleaf Road in Baltimore, Maryland. And once you got that, okay, so pick your childhood, any childhood memory will do, something that's vivid. And once you think about that, I can not only conjure that up in my mind, that experience, um, I can actually imagine what the house smelled like. I mean, there's like this olfactory memory. And I can feel the scratchiness of the wool uh, carpet and, uh, and then the, the hardness of the hardwood floor at the edge of the carpet. I mean, everything about it. I can picture lying there. I can um, hear, you know, she didn't have central air conditioning, and so the windows are open, and I can um, hear the locusts on a Baltimore summer day, uh, you know, coming in from outside the screen. So, you know, hang on to whatever memory that is, and you can smell it, you can feel it, you can taste it, uh, you can sense the textures. And now my question is, but were you there? And um, scientists tell us that, and I'm not a scientist at all, I'm an English major, and I guess I've got to be up front with that. I know there are deeply scientific people here that are way better than I am at this stuff, so bear with me. But um, I'm just learning. But they tell us that our um, uh, body cells kind of are completely regenerate every seven years or so. So there is not a single molecule in you today that was in you when you had that experience that you just remembered. So you were there, but you weren't. And I don't want to get, to, okay, I'm going to sound like Deepak Chopra for a second, okay? But <laughs> if you can think about life at the subatomic level, what we really are are patterns of distortion in the fabric of time and space, kind of these, you know, fluctuating through time and space. That's what we are. Um, the um, and that you know, it's, it's a cliche. The only thing permanent in life is change. Um, yeah, we hear that all the time. Our parents told us that, but I don't think we really. I, at least me. This is. Um, I don't think I really fully grasp all the time how much change we live in all the time. I mean, change is everywhere. Um, Anyway, and so that's what I want to talk about today. We'll get more into that. But this, this embracing change and dealing with the fact that it's, it's not like just um, another factoid of life. It's like essential to existence. It's, I mean, it's what life itself is, is change. Um, I was thinking about, you know, we talk about even geologic change being um, kind of slow. Like, we, use, we use the term glacial change, right, for something that's very slow to change. But sometimes glaciers change very fast, right? They sometimes they just collapse. Um, I had a chance to visit Ephesus, the ruins of Ephesus a few years ago. And Ephesus 2,000 years ago was on the coastline. Today it's five kilometers inland. And you can see from a mountain exactly how the river silted up and how it, it's like, that is crazy. Um, do you guys remember the old man in the mountain? Any New Englanders here? It was a series of granite cliff ledges and once I master the PowerPoint thing, I'll start having illustrations for you. I, I feel I'm not worthy, Jared. That was awesome today. Um, but it, it's a series of cliff, granite cliff ledges in uh, New Hampshire in the White Mountains that 
when you look at it from the north looks like the jagged profile of a face and this thing was the symbol of new hampshire i mean it was this is new hampshire it was on postage stamps on coins on license plates in may of 2003 one night the whole thing collapsed i mean this thing was like the rock of gibraltar for new hampshire people were so distraught by this that they came by the thousands and laid flowers at the base of the mountain our tendency to anthropomorphize like everything <laughs> um just one other geologic thing that I find fascinating. Like if you go to um, New Orleans and you're strolling along the French Quarter next to the, uh, you know, along the river there, um, uh, in the, uh, in front of the cathedral, uh, the um, even that is kind of an illusion. The Mississippi River doesn't want to be there. Um, just north of Baton Rouge, there's a structure called the Morganza Spillway that is forcing the Mississippi River to go on its ancient path because of the way, you know, water wants to go the fastest, most direct route to the sea. So the way the river wants to go now is down to the Atchafalaya Basin. Uh, the Morganza Spillway is uh, preventing that for the time being, but the Army Corps of Engineers says we're not going to be able to do this forever. Um, I like to be around, see, around when that happens. I just want to see, I mean, that'd be fascinating, but you know, uh, so, I mean, all this, like the nature of like the earth around is changing for me is just a reminder of just how, um, you know, everything else in life, just constant, constant change. Uh, did you guys ever go back to like your childhood home? I mean, I was thinking about this after you showed us the, you know, the map up there. Um, like you ever do, a, uh, you know, after years and years and years away, you went back to like the first house you ever lived in. That's a weird experience, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's like the house is smaller, the trees are bigger, <laughs> you know. The doorknobs used to be way up. Right, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Um, so not only do we live in a state of change, what's really challenging for us is that we live in this time of um, uh, increasing rate of change. Uh, you've probably heard of the Beloit College mindset list. And they started uh, compiling this in 1998, and it's the mindset of the incoming freshman class, and it's a kind of a, 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 a metric, a way to measure just how culture is shifting and you know what they're not familiar with. So this is in, this is this is a few from the 2016 and 2013 class. Um, incoming freshman for the 2016 class. Um, uh, Michael Jackson's family, not the Kennedys, constitute American royalty. If they miss The Daily Show, they can always get their news on YouTube. True. Um, Robert De Niro is thought of uh, not as Vito Corleone or Jimmy Conway, but who? Yeah, the uh, Greg Fokker's long-suffering father-in-law. Yeah. Um, uh, for most of their lives, um, the um, being Secretary of State has been a woman's job. Yeah, when you think about it, yeah, it's Madeleine Albright, Condoleezza Rice, and um, uh, Hillary. Um, having grown up with MP3s and iPods, they never listen to music on the car radio, and they have no use for radio at all. The biblical sources of terms such as forbidden fruit, the writing on the wall, Good Samaritan, and the Promised Land are unknown to most of them. Um, the Green Bay Packers have always celebrated with the Lambo Leap. <laughs> Uh, they have, uh, there have always been blue M&Ms, but no tan ones. <laughs> I know tan M&Ms. <laughs> have had to incessantly remind their parents not to refer to their CDs and DVDs as tapes. <laughs> uh, there's a couple more. Oh, have never seen an, airline, an airplane ticket, an airline ticket. Um, uh, salsa has always outsold ketchup. They have never used a card catalog to find a book. Um, they've never had to shake down an oral thermometer. <laughs> um, that's true. Um, I mean, it's the rate of change. Uh, May 24th, uh, 1844, Samuel Morris sends the first 
telegraph message on the first telegraph line from Baltimore to Washington, D.C., and his message is what? What hath God wrought? First message sent on the first telegraph line ever. And what strikes me about that moment is how, for all of human history, up to May 24, 1844, long-distance communications traveled at the speed of the person carrying the message, whether it was by sea or by foot or by um, just, you know, a horseback. I'm not going to count passenger pigeons and smoke signals, I, but, um, but you know what I mean. So, like, basically the method of long-distance communications never changed from the time of Plato to the time of the founding fathers of the United States. I mean, that's astonishing. And in 1844, bam, we go. Beep, 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 like that. Amazing. And then, of course, it's just all gone crazy since then. Anyone here remember ham radio? Yeah. That, that was, yeah. Were you an operator? Were you a ham, a ham or a, um, and Did anyone here have a, ever have an international pen pal? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and today, I mean, that's, you can go home and Skype to anybody all over the world. Um, but even with these incredibly good things that come along, we often get the sense that uh, change is uh, very painful, very hard. Um, I've got a couple of theories. I'd kind of be interested in hearing your ideas as well. Um, a couple, here, here are my thoughts, but let me know what you think. Um, I think one reason we experience change as being painful is that our, our brains are wired to do as many things automatically as possible. Automaticity. Uh, you don't have to think about how the route that you drive to work in the morning, do you? I mean, you just do it mindlessly. You exit the interstate mindlessly and the exits you have to get off on. I mean, think of all the different tasks that we have to, that we do every day that we just don't even think about, you know, from brushing your teeth to fixing, you know, starting the coffee machine, whatever. Um, our brains were, if you, if you ever took piano lessons and like haven't played the piano for years, I guarantee you there's some song that you can play that'll come back. And it might be a relatively difficult piece that you had to learn for a recital or something like that. And you haven't practiced for years, but you could sit down and you could play at least parts of that song now. Automaticity, it's a beautiful thing. But when our brains encounter something that, uh, that can't be done automatically, it often feels like, you know, like for me, getting a new phone is a pain, because the buttons and learn. I mean, it's like this entire orientation to a new culture every time, you know, or if you make a switch from Blackberry to, you know, iPhone or whatever. Um, so I think that's part of it. And then for me, the other, the other thing I'm thinking is, um, I think many of the changes we experience entail rejection. Um, whether it's leaving a job, or ending a relationship, or uh, any kind of, you know, sending you know, kids off to college. I mean, all these kind of emotional breaks that we experience in life. Um, I think, I think we experience some sort of rejection. And, and for me, it goes back to um, the fact that uh, in the ancestral environment, we evolved to be a tribal species, intensely tribal. And the very survival of the individual depended upon membership in the tribe. And as an intensely tribal species, we have evolved to experience rejection as a threat to our survival. I think that's why rejection is such a painful thing for us. Because once upon a time, you know, a bazillion years ago, um, our very survival depended upon not being rejected by the group. So any form of rejection we experience em emotionally as a threat to our survival. Now, of course, no rejection today is a threat to our survival. Very little chance that on the way home from here today, you're going to be attacked by predators or hostile tribes. Ain't going to happen. Our emotions don't know that. They don't. Um, our emotions are still thinking, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. <clears throat> and the flying monkeys still creep me out. Um, they were the wings, yeah. <laughs> um, I still don't know how they did that. Um, yeah, I mean, Wizard of Oz taps into really deep stuff, doesn't it? I mean, the film was made in 1939, and still, we still resonate with all of that. It's so part of us that we to go back to Kansas, you know? And, and that gets into the nostalgia thing. And advertisers and politicians know 
about um, our visceral reaction to the pain of change, and they appeal to it whenever it's beneficial to them. Uh, they offer warm images of a simpler, safer time. Uh, and this has been a constant theme throughout history, hasn't it? Every, you know, in virtually every era of human history, people have said, oh, the world is going down the tubes. The youth are rotten. No values. Socrates was condemned for what? Corrupting the youth of Athens. Um, every, I mean, it's not new to our time. This is a constant theme of human history. Um, there's a little ice cream company. They call themselves a creamery, how quaint. It's a big factory, um, about 90 miles up the road in Brenham. Uh, they make good stuff. I love their stuff. But they have these television commercials that feature bucolic scenes of happy cows and smiling people sitting in simple settings around outdoor tables, um, clogging their arteries with ice cream. And uh, it's, uh, and, and they're beautiful images. You know, it's all kind of like hazy, fuzzy, you know, with a golden hue to it. They're, per they're really, really well produced. And, uh, and if you watch any of the little creameries um, commercials, you'll notice that um, the scenes show people of different races mingling at the table. And I was watching this and thinking, wait a minute, I know people who grew up in Brenham back in the day. And it was segregated. <laughs> it was Old South. I, I know both white folks and black folks who grew up in Brenham back in the segregation days and talked about the days when <laughs> If you were walking along the sidewalk and you were African American, you had to get off the sidewalk for a white person to pass by. They weren't eating ice cream all happily <laughs> together up there. Um, but, see, that scene is an illusion. But the commercials are effective because they tap into that myth of the brief shining moment. Whether it was King Arthur's Court or the Kennedy administration, Camelot, um, we have this. You know, we, we do, we, we have this myth. Politicians do the same thing when they talk about restoring American values. Got to get back to the good old days. Said, you know, what good old days are they talking about? Segregation, you know, discrimination against minorities and women. Um, you know, go further back to slavery. Hmm? Prohibition. Prohibition. <laughs> yeah, threat of genocide. <laughs> Nuclear war. Nuclear war, the threat of nu yeah, um, yeah. No, that's um, that was just a little bit before my time, but I've been in up north. I've been in um, bomb shelters that were routinely built into houses uh, back during the Cold War. I mean, that was like standard thing you'd advertise when you're selling your house. You know, bomb shelter. Um, the implication is often. And it's like, it goes like this, doesn't it? It's a return to a safer time. Oh, back when we didn't have to lock our doors. The rate of almost all violent crimes in the United States has been dropping steadily for more than 20 years. It is demonstrably safer to be a child in the United States today than it was when any of us were growing up. You know what my car seat was when I was a toddler? <laughs> it had a little metal steering wheel with a car horn perfectly positioned to impale your little chest in the case of full front impact. And no airbag. But it was fun. It was fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was fun. Uh, when people want to get back to simpler times, what are they talking about? Smallpox? You know, polio? No microwaves, no antibiotics, forget it. Look, we all had good times in the past. Life has been good. I don't want to go back to any of it. I want to go forward. I want to see what surprises and wonders lie ahead. Um, so the good news about living in a state of change, so if the bad news is the world always changes, the good news is the world always changes, it means we're never stuck. We never have to accept the status quo. Uh, there was an interesting blurb in the latest issue of Scientific American Mind that talked about a strong correlation between openness and longevity. People who show cognitive flexibility and a willingness to entertain novel ideas tend to live longer than more rigid people. So you can look it up because they have all the studies and the data there. Um, I love that. 
Yeah, we have. Um, I've been I've been thinking about like phrases that we use every day in our language, and how much truth there is. And okay, you can't teach an old dog what. And it's totally not true, is it? No, I had a dog, um, like the old family dog who we got when I was in third grade. He was half old English sheep dog, uh, half something else, and a wonderful dog. You know, he was the dog had always slept on your bed and everything. And yeah. up and uh, and then up until um, uh, in college, uh, I was walking him one night, and I was taking him for a walk. And before we left the house, I had to drop the leash. He picked up the leash and put it in his mouth. And he wouldn't let me get the leash. So we went for a walk with the leash in his mouth. OK? And, uh, and that was, uh, and that became his routine. Like, he, would, he had to walk himself. He wouldn't, he wouldn't let you hold the leash anymore. But he wouldn't walk without the leash. He had had the leash in his mouth. I thought, wow, he's a really old dog. And that's a new trick. And uh, anybody who's ever owned a dog knows that they're always changing, aren't they? They do learn new stuff, and they surprise you. Um, we can do new things. Um, the, um, you know, as long as there's uh, breath in your body, it's never too late to try something new. I was uh, listening, maybe you heard this, it was on NPR uh, a couple weeks ago on Terry Gross's Fresh Air. Uh, an author, and I wish I could remember his name, and he didn't start writing until the age of 50. He's 62 now. He's had two published novels, critically acclaimed, and a collection of uh, short stories. And he, um, uh, and, and you know, it's, he's just really thrilled to be doing this very late in life. But before that, he had worked 30 years in a paper mill in Southern Ohio. And he had always been kind of interested in writing and stuff, but he just couldn't get his life together and, you know, could, couldn't finish college for a variety of reasons, and went through a couple of bad marriages and about with alcoholism. And yet, somehow, at 50, he was able to bring it together and write a novel. And I just think it's amazing. You know, none of us knows our life trajectory. We don't. Like, what amazing things could happen? Um, I'm going to close with a story that I wanted to close with last week, but um, we ran out of time. And this is a true story of how individuals can be catalysts for change in the world just with doing simple stuff. Um, one day in November 2000, a woman in Tel Aviv named uh, Natalia Wiesenthaler got the wrong number. She was trying to call a local friend, and instead she wound up talking to a guy in Gaza named Mohammed, a Palestinian. And instead of hanging up, uh, she asked him how he was. And he said his life, life was kind of bad right now. His wife was pregnant, was, had some health problems. Their city, was their town was under a, a strict curfew. And they ended up talking for like 20 minutes or so. And Natalia said, we weren't making apologies to each other. I wasn't trying to make him feel better. We were just talking as individuals. And at the end of the conversation, he said he was amazed that Jewish people were able to think like that. He thought we wanted all Palestinians dead. Thanks to caller ID, Mohammed got Natalia's number and called her back the next day. And to tell her uh, that talking with her had made a real change in his way of thinking. And the next day, his brother called her, and then his friend started calling her. And Natalia said, I think they all thought there was some weirdo Jew from Tel Aviv who just likes talking to Arabs. And I started thinking that if we could all talk like that about everyday stuff, we'd be amazed at how much we had in common. Acting on her thought, Natalia set up Hello Peace, an anonymous toll-free phone service that links individuals over the barriers of mistrust. Since its beginning, the switchboard for Hello Peace has logged over a million conversations. Conversations about what? It doesn't matter. It just got people talking. And um, in a small way, I think that's what we envision for this community. Uh, the team that kind of planned to bring this community together has this vision that we could be a catalyst for change. Um, and here's some of the long-term goals we could dream about. I mean, there's other things, because we don't, that's the beautiful thing about this, this amazing cause and effect web that we live in, is we don't know where things will take us in life, but here's some possibilities. We could have a community that has reason-based secular programming for the entire family, for people of all ages. Um, do you think someday the free thought community in Houston 
have come together to offer a citywide alternative to um, Vacation Bible School, um, especially the, the program run by a church. I, I won't say their name, but their initials are Second Baptist. <laughs> and, um, you know, a vacation science school, a vacation reason school, summer science day camp for kids of all ages. Do you think the free thinking people in Houston could come together someday to build a Houston Free Thought Center uh, that would have room for all of our free thought groups to meet whenever they wanted to? It would be a center of continued outreach to the community, offering ESL classes, literacy classes, and secular 12 step programs. Could we do something like that? I, I think we could. I think it could happen. Um, so uh, I thank you for being here today. Uh, any, any thoughts or comments or questions before we move on about the changes in the world? Are you, are you, are you optimistic? I mean, are you, I guess it's, are you optimistic about where the world is going? Suzanne? Well, I know. Um, I've been reading lately that uh, more and more secular student, I mean, I think the Secular Student Alliance is one of our great hopes. Mm -hmm. I've heard those are growing in schools and in colleges and, and, you know, even the high schoolers are having a hard time because they have to get first permission from the school and then they have to find a uh, faculty person to be their sponsor. And it's, they're just breaking down those walls more and more. I mean, they've had a hard time getting permission and then they've had a hard time finding a sponsor, but they, they persist and they're doing it. And all over the country, that's so cool. So I think they said like under 21 or something, the fastest growing uh, thing for non believers. Wow. Wow, that is really cool. That's very cool. Thanks for sharing that. Well, thanks for being here. Um, we're going to go into another piece of music with Pete. Or um, the, the CD I have available back there is uh, called Hippopotamonstrosis Clipidaliophobia. <laughs> That's a long word meaning the fear of long words. <laughs> Hopefully it goes along with the, the message. Uh, this song I'm, I'm going to play actually isn't on that CD. It's off an, an older CD. Uh, uh, and it's called You're Going Away Gift Because I'm Broke. <laughs> Musicians lament. I lost myself this time. Somewhere between <coughs> here and an ocean. Thinking I was blind. Somewhere between you and me This time, she said, you're always there for me. Well, I hope you know you're right this time. Anyway, it's along my way home. I know I'll stop and think of you, cause along your way home, I know I'll stop and Try, she said. Well, now, now, there are better things like butterflies and fairy tales through the glass. I think I'll be coming home when the wind begins to blow for you. It's along my way home. I know I'll stop and think of you, cause along your way. Stop it.
do is a, uh, let's call through these words. <laughs> saying here now we're trying to find something to talk about we might relax and find a way to get around the things now we don't mind for the miles and miles well the people they come your way because your hair your eyes your smile in the moonlight your hair your eyes your smile in my dreams your hair your eyes your smile in the moonlight Hear your eyes, your smile in my dreams, so please. So please, 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 please. thank you. So I will miss you. So I would have kissed you through these words, through these words. Now we're, we're trying to find something to talk about With the suits and the wallets and the way you might even have called me out So don't mind for the, the miles and miles well the People that come your way, but you hear your eyes, your smile In the moonlight, you hear your eyes, your smile In my dreams, you hear your eyes, your smile In the moonlight, you hear your eyes, your smile so please, so please, 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 thank you. So I will miss you. So I will have kissed you through these words.